tucked neatly in the neighborhood of Gisozi, right on the edge of the nation's capital, Kigali, is a place that every African leader or wannabe leader needs to visit at least once. This is the Kigali Genocide Memorial. Seven and a half acres of sadness and sorrow where you come face to face with the gruesome brutality and savagery of a people simply gone mad. On the evening of April the 6th, 1994, a plane carrying the presidents of both Rwanda and Burundi was shot out of the skies as it approached Kigali International Airport. Everyone on board was killed in the fiery blaze. That same evening, groups of militiamen known as the Interahamwe, loosely translated in the Hutu language as those who hunt and kill together, set up roadblocks around the capital and the country and began to single-handedly and systematically eliminate their rival tribe, the Tutsis. What followed was as primitive as it was medieval. The weapons of choice, pangas or machetes, axes, bows and arrows, and all manner of crude weapons. No one, it seemed, was spared. Entire Tutsi families were wiped out. Tutsis married to Hutus were wiped out. Hutus married to Tutsis were wiped out. Anyone associated with the Tutsi tribe was targeted for elimination. It was, of course, an orchestrated, pre-planned genocide. The perpetrators had to know their targets and, more importantly, who to go after. Something of this horrendous magnitude could not have happened at the spur of the moment. By the time the orgy of hatred and horror had ended, close to a million, mostly Tutsis and moderate Hutus, had been brutally murdered in a little more than three months. 100 days of unspeakable madness and mayhem. As the world turned its back on Rwanda, one man and his group of determined, disciplined rebel forces decided to do something about it. Paul Kagame, the tall, skinny, former refugee turned rebel leader, turned liberator. Right here in this church, several hundred Tutsi families seeking refuge in the one place they thought would be a safe haven. I remember reporting in Rwanda after the genocide. We traveled across the entire country, from Nharama to Kibuye, from Kikongoro to Busenyi, and in every hamlet, in every village, in every town, and in every district, we came across countless victims of the genocide who lay where they had been murdered. In their homes, in their churches, in their schools, in hospitals, in maize fields, and even in pit latrines. It was as shocking as it was bone chilling. Rwandans then were not ready to forget their ugly past. It's almost as though they wanted to keep things as they were, as an everyday reminder of a country's indescribable brutality. Now, in 2004, the Kagame administration decided to build memorials like this one across the country and ordered a team to retrieve the now decayed remains and give them a decent and honorable resting place. This one in Kigali is the largest one of all. Memorial sites like this may help heal the physical scars of genocide. I was here in Kigali 16 years ago, reporting on the finishing touches that were being made to the Kigali Genocide Memorial to coincide with the 10th anniversary. Starting in 2004 and every year since, on the 7th of April, President Kagame leads his nation in lighting the symbolic everlasting flame, a sign of hope and healing in a land so scarred and so battered. The flame stays lit for exactly 100 days. Now I'm standing on what can only be described as holy ground. You see these concrete slabs beside me? These aren't just concrete slabs. These are the vaults 
containing tens of thousands of remains of Rwandans who were killed in those 100 days of unspeakable horror. There are about 10 vaults like these spread across this entire genocide memorial. Each vault contains the remains of 25,000 bodies. Do the math. That's a quarter of a million remains. And those were the ones found just here in Kigali alone, in homes and schools, in offices and churches, in pit latrines and gullies and ditches and rivers. All the remains here as a reminder of what took place 26 years ago. Beneath these slabs of concrete, our fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, aunties and uncles, grandfathers and grandmothers. But even more tragic is that more and more remains continue to be unearthed around Kigali as construction crews break new ground to put up the capital's latest skyscrapers. And so this giant graveyard continues to expand a few acres every year, adding more victims to the already crowded numbers. Blaise Rutajengwa is just one of countless survivors of this horrific chapter of Rwanda's history. His father, Kostikat Stanislaus Rutajengwa, was a wealthy businessman back in the 1990s and closely allied with the Rwandan Patriotic Front. We found Blaise on this day as he came to lay flowers at his father's grave. He lives in the town of Musanzi, two hours outside Kigali in the country's north. But whenever he's in Kigali, he passes by this dark and dreary place to pay his respects. His aging mother is too sick to travel, and his two remaining sisters are scattered across the United States. Blaze was seven years old when his father was murdered in cold blood, as the rest of the family watched in horror. Dad, I'd like to say... It's been a rough 26 years without you. Um, I only wish you were here because uh, life without a father was uh, one of the hardest lives I ever lived. And I'm glad I'm still alive. Um, in the name of the Holy Spirit, you rest in peace. He remembers it like it was yesterday. The ninth. The morning of the 9th, two presidential guards come at the house in a jeep, in a French jeep, I don't know what kind, in Mark, I was seven years old. They come to our house, the gate, and they're looking for him. They knock, they, they ask the, the, the housekeepers, the gates, they're like, open the gate, we want to get in. They're like, no, we're not opening for you. Uh, he's not expecting you, we're not opening. And then they were like, okay, well, um, it, was, it was a pretty high fence. It was like four, it was almost, what, five meter high. So if they don't open the gate, the guys have to jump over. So they go back to the Jeep, they grab uh, these, these commando straps, uh, like, like not wires, I don't know how to call it, ropes. Mm -hmm. They throw them over the fences and they, they climb one by one to the other side. And they, they get inside their compound. My dad was seeing this from the, the woman that's hiding us, the white woman. She's like, look, they're going to find the ladder that we climbed on to come to this fence. If they do, they would come here and they're killing all of us. So let me, I'll take one for the team. Yeah. Me, yeah for, so he talks to my, mo uh, to my mother. He's like, look, uh, I'm going to go and, and I don't, I'm not coming back. Because they're looking for me now. They climbed in. They're in. They're going to kill me. But, you know, uh, talk to this guy. Talk to that guy. Money's here. And, you know, see you in heaven. He says bye to us. He, he goes back over the fence to back to our compound. He says, Hey guys, you're looking for me, I'm here. We're here for your blood. And they ask him, look, don't make this any longer than it has to be. You know, you're not gonna survive. So they tell him, you have three minutes to, 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 to no, he, they, no, they ask him, do you want a bullet? Where do you want the bullet? So one guy pulls out a pistol. They had AK-47s, other guns. He pulls out a pistol, he says, and we're watching this from the window, all of us, and we're listening. And they're like, where do you want the bullet? In your head, in the temple, or in the heart? He's like, in the, in the temple, but give me three minutes, let me pray. So he gets on his knees, looks up in the air, and he prays. While he's praying, his three minutes are up, the guy goes to the side, cocks the gun, 
pulls the trigger and kills him. He is now 33, having moved back to Rwanda after years in refugee camps before finally ending up in the United States. He's trying to pick up the pieces of his father's former thriving businesses. The most painful thing he says is seeing former killers taking over properties that were once his family's. You see them every day? Every day I, I meet them and their kids. And they, they still have the same hate for me as they did for my father, you know. And the case went through Gachacha? It went through Gachacha and it was never resolved. 26 years later, yeah. yes? 26, our, our whole family was just dumbfounded because there's witnesses. People who went to jail uh, during, uh, like, because of committing crimes of genocide came out and even testified on our behalf that they were helping stack up the safes, the goods for those guys. You know, and they're next to us. Blaze says it is easy to forget after 26 years of pain and suffering, but forgiving what happened is another thing altogether. How can I, how can I, how can I forgive? How can I say, you know what, you know, um, rest in peace, my dad. I, everything is great now. It's gravy. It's good. Kumbaya, let's sing it. No, I can't because my sisters, I can't see them. My siblings, I can't. I can't. My, my dad's properties are all gone. And 26 years later, I am still, I have to run these properties, family-wise. Uh, the parent is, is, is suffering from all types of diseases. You know, you name a heart disease, you know, backache, uh, you know, eye surgery last year, the year before stroke. And, and my, 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 I'm the only son. My sister, the one is married. The other, we barely communicate. Money is hard. We're young. In the 20s and 30s, we're turning... We're going to the 30s. Now I'm back because I wanted to just face everything and help his name go up again. And I got everything against me, the whole world. You know, if my father was alive, none of this happens, none of this. So 26 years, I'm affected heavily by what happened on April 9th. Now, Blaze's story is not new. The entire country's population of 12 million people have very similar stories. Now, one of the most important things about any memorial in any part of the world, at least for the sake of the victims and the survivors, are the names. Here at the Kigali Genocide Memorial, it's no different. But what chills my blood to the bones is that a lot of the names keep repeating themselves almost as though there's family members, one after another, after another, after another. So just imagine for a moment, a family driving down the streets of Kigali 26 years ago, pulled over at a checkpoint. The children seeing the parents being yanked out and being slaughtered with machetes and pangas in front of them. That's bone chilling enough. Now imagine the children thinking that, knowing that you could be next, or you could be next, or you could be the next. You've seen the giant concrete slabs and you've seen the names. When we come back, I'll take you inside the Kigali Genocide Memorial, where we'll put faces to names, the young, the old, Men, women, infants. It's a walk inside the dungeons of hell. But it is something that must be told and retold and retold.